Hey, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would uh, just give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. We thank you for this time together, and we pray that you be glorified in all that we say and do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So good morning. This is Thursday, October 5th, around 12.25 p.m. My name is Jeff Johnson. I'm the pastor of Calvary Chapel Grand Junction. Let me just say, if you're watching this video, it means that I did not make it. Don't get me wrong, I'm still alive. <laughs> but I had surgery Friday morning and I'm probably in too much pain to be there uh, in person with you. So I asked my doctor last week, what are my chances of teaching next Sunday, two days after my surgery? About 50-50, so I would have a backup plan. So thanks to Emily, uh, this is the backup plan. He suggested uh, recording this. And so uh, we're going to start uh, with a, a story, hopefully that will tie in with the message. And I heard this story about this man who was sick and tired of living in the midst of this evil and wicked, sinful world. And so he decides to join a monastery. And so he finds one, and their number one rule was this. You had to take a vow of silence, and only after two years could you speak two words. And so after his first two years in the monastery, the abbot, the head of the monastery, comes to him and says, My son, you may now speak your two, two words. What would you like to say? And the man replied, Hard bed. Well, another two years go by, and the abbot says to him, My son, you may now speak your next two words. What would you like to say? The man said, Bad food. So two more years go by, and the abbot says, You may speak your next two words. And so after six years, this time the man says, I quit. And after hearing those two words, the abbot said, Well, I'm not surprised you've done nothing but complain ever since you've been here. Applause, applause. Well, as we pick up in Exodus chapter 16, we really begin to see the Israelites grumbling and complaining against Moses, which is really complaining against God. After all, it was God who delivered them from being slaves in Egypt. It was God who spared them from when the death angel passed over the land of Egypt and killed every firstborn in those houses that did not have the blood of the lamb upon their doors. It was God who spared them with the crossing of the Red Sea as he miraculously opened up the Red Sea and the Jewish people went on dry land, but then he destroyed Pharaoh's army in the midst of the waters. It was God who turned the bitter waters of Marah into sweet, fresh water. And remember, God is the one who is leading them on this journey, not Moses. Moses is simply following the pillar of of cloud. He's following the pillar of fire that the Lord was in the midst of. And so we left off with the Israelites camping out at the 12 wells of water in the oasis known as Elam. And this was a place where everybody could relax and get fresh, refreshed. But now the Lord is going to do something uh, where he leads them further into desolation but this would be the perfect place for God once again to show them that He is all that they need. He is the one who will demonstrate His power, His provision, literally out in the middle of nowhere. So we pick up in chapter 16, verse 1. It says, And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So the Israelites are about 45 days into their journey. Remember, God started their religious calendar on the day of Passover. And so the 15th day of the second month would be about 45 days later. But as the pillar lifts from Elam, as the people follow that cloud, and the Lord stops them between, it says, Elam and Sinai, probably referring to Mount Sinai, and it's in this area called the wilderness of sin. Now, it's not the wilderness of immorality and wickedness. It's probably an abbreviation for the wilderness near Mount Sinai. But either way, this area is about as desolate, as a, it's about as remote as you can get. So watch what happens next. Look at verse 2. 
Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Again, can you imagine Moses having two and a half to three million grumblers and complainers? Now, I see two things happening here. Number one is this is a picture of human nature at its very worst. We can certainly be nasty people. We can certainly be miserable. We can certainly be self-centered as we whine and complain and uh, we grumble about so many people, about so many situations we find ourselves in. And it's a graphic picture of our old sin nature. Now, remember what I said a few weeks ago. It took God only one day to get the Israelites out of Egypt, but it's taken 40 years to get Egypt out of his people. But nobody benefits from being around a bunch of grumblers and complainers. It just drags everybody down. It just drags everything that you've done down. Now, the second thing we'll see happening here is even though this is a picture of mankind at his worst, it's also a picture of God at his best. Because despite all the grumbling and complaining from the people, we'll see that God's grace and his patience and his provision is on a scale for all of us. It's hard to imagine. In fact, Psalm 103, look at these verses starting in verse 11 King David writes, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who seek him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are but dust. And so in spite of all their grumbling and complaining, God was present with them in the pillar of cloud and in the pillar of fire. He was constantly watching over them. He was protecting them. And again, he would provide for them in miraculous ways. Now look at verse 3 here once again, where it says, And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat and when we had ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So talk about having selective memory. How quickly they forgot about the brutal beatings that they received from the Egyptians. Pots of meat and bread to the full. They were barely surviving in Egypt. They were constantly groaning and moaning for nearly 400 years as they baked bricks in the Egyptian heat. Now, Satan is the one who is very good at whitewashing our past lives when we were unsaved people. He tries to distort the past. He tries to trick us into thinking, you know, wasn't life so much better before Jesus interrupted you? Wasn't life so much more fun and easy before Jesus came into your life? Wasn't that the good life? Are you kidding me? My life was miserable. My life was empty. My life was confused. I was lost. I was dead in my sins. But then Jesus saved me. He brought me to life. He washed all my sins away. He gave me eternal life. The Apostle Paul says it like this in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. What says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But to me, the worst part of Israel's attitude is how they view God at this moment. They say, we were better off dying in Egypt by the hands of the Lord than to die of starvation in this wilderness. Oh man, how short-sighted can they be? I mean, this is one of many examples that seeing signs and wonders does not always equal believing and trusting in the Lord. God will do miracle after miracle, but most of them will not trust God, let alone be thankful to God. But once again, all of us who follow Jesus 
and who are saved. We have so much to be thankful for. God has done everything for our salvation. We cannot say thank you enough for what Jesus has done for us. And so even with all their grumbling and complaining, God will once again show how merciful and how gracious he really is. Look at verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we? that you complain against us. So this has got to be one of the most gracious things God could have done at this moment where it says he rains bread from heaven upon them. Now, if I was God, and praise the Lord I'm not, I would probably rain something else upon all these grumblers and complainers like fire and brimstone, just saying. But here God in his grace gives them manna from heaven. This is the original wonder bread, and God would use this to sustain the Jewish people for 40 years out there in the desert. But did you also notice that God said that this was also going to be a test, and here's part of the test here. He says you can only gather up manna every single morning, and it has to be eaten that same day. In other words, you could not store it up. So God wanted them to know that they could trust him, that they could depend upon him every single day. This would press them into a relationship with God and cause them to see their need for God on a daily basis. This would remind us that God doesn't want us to look at him as some kind of a genie in a bottle or to look at him as some kind of a winning lottery ticket, but God wants a relationship with us and he wants us to come to him. He wants us to receive from him daily. Now listen, God will allow situations into our lives that will press us to learn how to trust him, learn how to rely upon his goodness and his grace every day. Did you also notice that he says on Friday they would be able to gather twice as much manna so that they can enjoy their rest on the Sabbath on Saturday? And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But I love verse 7. Again, it says, In the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. And we'll see what Moses is referring to here in a moment. Look at verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. Now they're talking about their pots being filled with meat and their bread in full in, in Egypt, which was not true. But here God says, you're going to see the real thing. You're going to have, you know, your fill in the evening and your bread in the morning will be for your fill. You're going to be full of this. For the Lord hears your complaints, which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. And so again, even though they're directing their complaints at Moses, their real complaint was against the Lord. After all, it was the Lord who has put them in this situation. And the same thing is true. When we start grumbling, when we start complaining against the Lord, and we grumble about the situations that God has brought into our lives, but again, God only brings us to difficult circumstances so that we would see our need for the Lord, that we would depend on Him, that we would learn to trust Him with everything. We would learn to trust Him, and what we really need is a closer walk with Him. So look at verse 9. Then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord for he has heard your complaints. This is such a true statement. The Lord has heard your complaints. 
In other words, God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He knows everything about everything. He knows our hearts. He knows what's going on in our minds. And the amazing thing is he still loves us. He still wants to rain manna from heaven upon us. He knows everything you said, everything you did, everything you thought yesterday, the week before. But aren't you glad that he casts our sins as far as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more? We need to praise the Lord for his mercy and grace. Well, look at verse 10. Now it came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And so here's where they see the glory of God appearing in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them saying at twilight, you shall eat meat in the morning. You shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Again, God in his grace and mercy is proving to his people, I am the Lord your God. I am all you will ever need. I am your provider. I am your protector. I am your deliverer. And I will be with you no matter how hot the desert gets, no matter how hot the furnace becomes. And we see this throughout the word of God, that the Lord is with his people. He was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember when they were thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar, and it was all because they refused to bow down and worship that 90-foot gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar made of himself. And because they refused to, Nebuchadnezzar said, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. It was heated up seven times hotter than usual. And we read this in Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You know how true that was. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I truly believe that Jesus Christ himself was in the midst of that fiery furnace with them. And the same is true for all of us. The Lord wants us to know that he is with us always, even to the end of this age. The Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he wants us to trust him that he knows what is best for our lives. He wants us to come to him daily. He wants us to feed upon the manna of his word daily. Even Jesus taught us to pray to the Father. Give us this day our daily bread, not weekly, not monthly, not twice a year on Christmas and Easter, but daily. Look at verse 13. It says, So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Again, what an incredible scene this is. That evening, it says, God covers the camp with quail. As you know, quail are little birds, and they taste a lot like chicken. And so God sends Probably, I mean, you'd eat two or three quail. So he's probably sending six to nine million quail into their camp. And that says everybody eats to their full. Isn't that amazing? You know, companies like DoorDash and Grubhub, they didn't invent anything new. God's delivery system puts them all to shame. Even Chick-fil-A, they say they make, uh, throughout our country, they make about one and a half million chicken sandwiches a day. Well, God can outdo that five times over. 
And so they had this great barbecue of all these quail that he sends into the camp. They had their meat to the full. But then it says in the morning, they wake up to this big surprise. A whole desert floor is covered with this little round frosty substance that was white and sweet like honey. And when the Israelites wake up and look outside their tents, they all start asking each other, what is it? In fact, the Hebrew word for manna means, what is it? And the name stuck. And for the next 40 years, they would call this the what is it bread. And this would be the main source of food that God will use to keep his people healthy and strong. But unfortunately, it won't take very long for the people to even start complaining and grumbling about the manna. They'll be saying, we're tired of this manna. We want something else to eat. We're tired of all the recipes you've come up with, Moses. We've run out of ways to fix it. We can only eat so much manna pancakes. We can only eat so much manna bread and, and manna cotty. Give us something new. And so the sad thing was they get bored with God's heavenly bread and they wanted something different. In their minds, they want something tastier. They want something that lasts longer. They want something that would satisfy their fleshly appetites. Now, unfortunately, this carries over to what we see in a lot of Christians today. After all, who and what does the manna represent today? The answer is Jesus Christ and the Word of God. That is the manna that we feast upon. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 men with the little boy's lunch? Afterwards, they followed Jesus because they liked how he took care of their physical needs. And Jesus even told them, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. And then a few verses later, we read this in John chapter 6, starting in verse 31. The people said to Jesus, Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now the he there, they're referring to Moses. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And as you go through the rest of John chapter 6, it quickly becomes apparent that the people did not want to believe in and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They just wanted the kind of Messiah that would give the people what they wanted to make them you know, happy, to fill their bellies. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of people look at Jesus and his word today. They're not satisfied with a daily walk with the Lord. They're not satisfied with being in God's word. Well, that's boring. That's outdated. I want something new and improved. Well, I'm sorry to break the news to you, but there is no way that you can have a new and improved Jesus. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. You cannot have a new and improved Jesus. And His Word... Well, it's still the only way to know God and grow in our relationship with Him. And He's provided all that we need by giving us His Holy Spirit, by giving us the living Word of God. Now look at these verses. It says in Matthew 24, 35, Jesus tells us, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. The manna didn't last, but God's Word will never pass away. When Jesus was praying to the Father in John 17, verse 17, he said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God's word is absolute truth. We can believe it from Genesis to Revelation. That is God's word to us. And so don't ever grumble and complain about God's heavenly bread. But I encourage you to go to Jesus and his word daily. Let him satisfy your heart, your mind, your soul. 
daily. After all, his eternal word will never run dry. His word will never leave you lacking. Jesus says this concerning the word of God, Matthew 4, verse 4. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Job 23 verse 12 says, I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jeremiah 15 verse 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. And so again, it's the Holy Spirit of God that takes the word of God, and that is how Jesus transforms us into the people of God that he uses to bless those around us. And so don't ever think you've reached the depths of knowing God's word. You've not reached the depths of knowing or understanding God's word because the more you read it, the more God will reveal himself to you. And because this is God's eternal word, we can never fully comprehend it this side of heaven. Like Paul prays that we might grow in God's grace, that we might comprehend what is the width and the length and the depth and the height of Jesus' love for us and to be filled with all the fullness of God. We haven't comprehended that yet, but God wants us to continually grow in our relationship with Him. Now look at verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, one omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And so God supernaturally supplied every Israelite with exactly how much they needed. Now, what is an omer? Uh, there's a lot of different opinions on it. One says it's about 3.7 quarts, so just under a gallon. Now, this would equal a few different ways to look at it. If you do the multiplication, it equals about 4,500 tons of manna every single day. And God would give this to them for 40 years. Incredible. Every day was a miracle day with God and for his people. And it says nobody lacked anything. God freely gave them all that they needed. Now, there were a couple of basic rules that God gave them concerning the manna. Rule number one, look at verse 19. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. I love that word. It stank. Remember when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus? He'd been dead and buried for four days, and Jesus said, Roll away the stone. And Martha, I think it was, says, Lord, by now he stinketh. This is stinky, wormy manna because they left it till the next morning. And Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. I mean, it's almost like snow. I mean, it's there every morning, but then it would melt under the afternoon sun. Now, sadly, we once again see there were some people who just would not listen to God's simple word through Moses. God made it very clear. You cannot store it up for the next day. You must gather only what you can eat that day. Otherwise, it would breed worms and it stink. The lesson for us is simply this. We shouldn't try to spiritually live off of one sermon on a Sunday morning. You know, we can't live off of one message for the entire week. 
But each one of us should be reading, we should be heeding, we should be feeding upon God's Word daily. And I know for myself, if I find my walk with the Lord becoming stinky or stagnant, it's usually an indication that I'm not spending enough time feeding upon God's Word. I'm not allowing the rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit, to flow freely in and through my life. And so we need to be careful not to live off of yesterday's successes, but we need a closer walk with Jesus every single day. And when we go through the scriptures, it's interesting how many times the word daily comes up. Again, Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Look at these verses. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus tells us, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. In Acts 2.46, we read, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In Acts 17, verse 11, the Bereans were commended as it says, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And so they were searching the scriptures every day to find out if the things Paul was saying about Jesus from the Old Testament were true. And he, they were commended for doing that, searching the scriptures daily. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. That's part of taking up your cross daily and following Jesus. You're dying to your flesh. You're dying to your wants and your will. And you're saying, not my will today, Lord, but your will be done. And that's a daily process. Again, there are many examples throughout the scriptures. But the point is, Jesus loves us today. And he loves us always. And he wants us to draw near to him every day of our lives because he wants us to know him more. He wants us to depend upon him more. He wants us to trust him more. I mean, the Israelites, they were totally dependent upon God. And in many ways, they were learning how to trust the Lord. Now, think about this. Let's say you wake up on a Monday morning and God sends the manna. You gather it up, you, you bake it, you eat it throughout the day, and you think to yourself, will it be here tomorrow? Is God going to send it again? Maybe that's why the temptation was there to try to store it up. They were still not quite sure if they could count on the Lord. So God was teaching them, you know, basically saying, my children, you can trust me. I will do what I promised I will do. So look at verse 22. So it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will fi not find it in the field. So the only time God did not send it was on the Sabbath, on the Saturday morning. Six days, verse 26, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So even before God gave the law of the Sabbath to Moses, he establishes the seventh day as a day of rest, the Sabbath rest. You know, we see this in Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth, created everything in this world in six days, and then on the seventh day he rested. Not because he was tired, but because he was finished. And so only on Friday could the Israelites gather twice as much manna, and it would last through Saturday. And so on Friday, that would mean God would send 9,000 tons of manna. So a double miracle. 
Verse 27, Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Again, back in verse 4, God says that he was going to test the people in regards to the manna. And this is the second part of the test. Gather twice as much as you need on Friday because none will be given on Saturday. And here we see that some failed this simple test. But again, God was very patient. He was certainly faithful to them. After all, those who did not have anything to eat on Saturday because they didn't gather enough, the Lord would rain down more manna for them on Sunday. And so they might have had to be a little bit hungry on the Sabbath, but God would provide more the next day. And that's important to realize. We may have disobeyed the Lord. We may have missed his blessing yesterday or today, but God is still faithful. He's still faithful to do his will in your life today, tomorrow. And so, will you humble yourself today? Will you surrender your life back over to Jesus? He's always ready to do a good work in our lives. He's just waiting for us to draw closer to him once again. Now look at verse 29. It says, See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days, let every man remain in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called its name manna. And it was like white coriander seed. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So even in this, I see God's grace at work in their midst. In other words, he even made the manna taste good. I mean, it was a coriander seed-like wafer that was sweet like honey. I mean, God could have made it blah, you know, like plain rice cakes or like styrofoam packing peanuts, which is basically what rice cakes taste like. But no, God is gracious to them. It, it, it was basically this yummy sweet wafer and again, you're, we're told they could bake it. They probably grind it up. They would bake it. They make different things out of it. You could boil it. Maybe they were having manna oatmeal. I'm sure they came up with all kinds of recipes. But this heavenly bread provided all the nourishment that all the people would need. Again, it was like the perfect food. And in like manner, God has given us his perfect food, his word. His word is what sustains us. This alone will nourish our souls. This alone is sweet to the taste. In other words, this alone, God's word, will truly satisfy. One final verse, Psalm 119, verse 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Oh, how good the Lord's word is. Finally, we look at verse 32. Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel ate manna forty years until they came to an, inhabit, to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. So hopefully that clarifies the measurement. I have no idea what that means. But when you think about the fact that manna had a very short expiration date, lasted about a day, putting manna in a jar that it would eventually be placed in the Ark of the Covenant, and it would last for a few hundred years, well, that was just a miracle. Because they put this, he says, put an omer of manna, so almost a gallon in this jar, and along with Aaron's rod, his staff that budded, and along with the tablets of the Ten Commandments, this 
pot of manna was put into the Ark of the Covenant later on after they built the tabernacle. But God did that as a reminder to future generations of Israelites who would dwell in the land of promise that God would faithfully provide for them as well. And so what a great chapter this is. You know, may we be a people that seek the Lord daily. May we spend time gathering up the manna that he has for us every single day as we look to Jesus and go to his word. And may we always have grateful hearts. After all, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And just think of all the blessings we have because Jesus loves us and because Jesus has saved us. And because we are in Christ, the Bible is very clear, because we are in Jesus, we are saved, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, we are accepted, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in Christ's victory today, tomorrow, until the Lord comes for His bride. And He's preparing a place for us in glory. Again, Jesus has done everything for us. So I leave you with that encouraging word. Hang on to the Lord. Daily seek Him in His word. And so let's close in a word of prayer. And Aaron, where are you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would continually remind us of your goodness and your grace and your love for each one of us here. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that today they would open up their heart to you and realize they have sinned against you. But Lord, you're the one who died on the cross and shed your blood so that their sin could be forgiven and removed. Lord, you want to give them eternal life. And that life is found only by receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so, Father, I pray that we would all draw near to you, knowing that you love us, knowing that you care for us, knowing that you are with us always to the end of this age. And so thank you, Lord. We look forward to the next time we can be together and hopefully in person. And we just commit this day into your hands, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week with the Lord.